Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Clint. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. It's nice and chilly here in Utah. It's a cold day, but I'm doing well. Oh, brilliant. So nice to meet you virtually uh, to the to the thank you Zoom for allowing us to do this around the world <laughs> at this time. And um, yeah, I mean, it's still cold here in the UK too, but it's starting to warm up a little bit. We just had our warmest day yesterday or from the whole year. So it's season was unseasonably kind of warm for us and uh but yeah we could still get snow in march as well and uh just for the listeners we're talking on the 25th of february (laughs) so uh it's still winter (laughs) most places (laughs) yeah it's uh it's so nice here in utah though i mean because yes it's cold but the mountains and the snow and Mm. there's that, that beautiful side that comes with it too that's that's always nice but it is cold. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you're warm where you are. And let's dive into the podcast. My opening question for all my guests is very simple. And that is to begin with, share a little bit about your personal life, Clint. So where were you born? Have you moved around uh, schooling, education, and then take us into your first job and then we'll get to current day through that route over to you yeah sounds great so i was born in uh, bountiful utah and grew up most of my life in the utah area we lived in texas for a little while we lived in kansas kind of the the, the, the middle part of the u.s and then we moved back to utah so utah's really been home for me and something for sure when it comes to like my life story <clears throat> i am the person that believes that single moments in time have the ability to change your life yes. and it's the moments that really make a great story so you know when i think about my life story it is the moments that i think about we don't remember days we remember moments and mm. when i was young i i wanted to fly michael like i wanted to be a pilot so bad i yeah. was the kid that had every toy helicopter and airplane that you could buy at the toy store that was hanging in my ceiling. And I just, I don't know, there was something about aviation that I really enjoyed. And I graduated as a high school, a senior with my pilot's license. And I had worked so hard and went to flight school. And then after I graduated, I did a study abroad for two years. And then I came home and I had to go to the DMV. So it's the place to go to renew your driver's license so that I could, I could still drive. Yeah. And I remember walking in and at the DMV, you do a vision test because they yeah. got to make sure you can see to drive. And I put my head in this little black box to, to, to read off the letters. Mm-hmm. And all I could see in the black box was six black dots. It was white, but six dots, no letters. And yeah. I looked at the lady and I said, I think your machine's broken. Um, because I, 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 the letters aren't, it's not, it's not working. Yeah. Said, we'll push harder. And so I went back in and I, I clicked again and still six black dots. She eventually, she came around the counter, pushed me out of the way and then put her head in the black box. And she read out loud, C-K-G-E-L-F-W-Z-Y-N. Mm. And then, and then she looked at me and she said, honey, can you read? And I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, come on. I was like, yes, I can read. And then she said, well, then I think you're blind. Because if you're not seeing the black dots, if you're not seeing the letters, if, uh, then we've got an issue. Yeah. And I, I kind of laughed and I said, listen, I said, lady, I drove here today. <laughs> and she said, well, you're not driving back. Whoa. It was a moment. It was a moment, Michael. She took the stamp and pushed it on my paperwork in red and it and it said denied whoa right. um i was under house arrest at the dmv i could not leave i had to call my my mom and i said i i don't know what's going on i said mom but they're not letting me they're not letting me drive mm. long story short i ended up at a place called the moran eye center at the university of utah 
with one of the top leading authorities in a rare and degenerative eye disease known as keratoconus. Right. And that was the day that I was diagnosed with keratoconus. And keratoconus is a rare degenerative eye disease and it's a thinning of the corneas. And my yeah. corneas were getting thinner and thinner. And as a 21 year old kid, my eyes were as bad as an 87 year olds. And I'll never forget because that's when, that's when the doctor asked, he said, well, what do you want to do with your life? You know, what do you want? What's your plan for your future? Yeah. And I said, I want to fly. Mm. I said, doctor, I said, listen, nobody wants to fly more than I do. Yeah. And then he, he got really serious and he looked at me and he said, it's never going to happen. Whoa. It's never going to happen. He said, you have until age 31, 32, until you will go blind. You are mm. losing your sight. Whoa. And, and, that's a moment in my life story that's very critical to the story because there I was as a young person who had my eye on the sky, right? And then I watched in a moment as that sky fell in all around me. Mm. And I went from, you know, having purpose, direction, uh, you know, this, this sense of ambition to having no idea what to do in my life. Yeah. And so, you know, what do you do when you, you don't have no idea what you want to do with your life? You go to university, right? <laughs> you go to college. Uh, yeah. you, 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 you kind of go to go figure out what to do with your, your life. So I ended up at university and uh, I graduated um, with a bachelor's degree in, in speech communication and leadership. But my yeah. dad worked in the medical field and everybody said, well, go into the medical field. It's stable. It's always going to be around. You get yeah. the benefits. You, you'll get paid well. And so to be honest, I kind of chased, I chased the money. Right? Because there's some realities to life that life costs money. Like you got yep. bills to pay if you want to live as a responsible human being. Mm. And I ended up going into uh, two years of medical school and became an orthopedic specialist. And I worked in orthopedics in the operating room for five years post college. And every day, Michael, I was miserable. I was, wow. I was just. Here's the thing in college, college was really cool for me because I was taught by a lot of really amazing mentors. Yeah. And I had a mentor that shared with me a quote by, by a British playwright. His name is Oscar Wilde. Yes. And, and the quote is to live is the rarest thing in the world. <laughs> for most people just exist. And that is all. And, and, and that quote, literally changed my life because and it haunted me every day because I was just I was just existing yes. every day it was like rinse and repeat nine to five doing the same thing day in and day out and then Mark Twain the Mark Twain quote was was there's two important days in a person's life the day you're born and then the day you figure out why <laughs> every day every day I was working in the the, the operating room and I just was telling myself, this is not why I was put here. This is not why I'm, I, I was born. I was not born to do this. No. And, and it kind of now leads up to the end of the story in present day. Uh, I was sitting in a, in a, in a, a burger joint, like a, like a fast food restaurant with two of my buddies that were college graduates. We were hanging out. We were all single at the time. And out of frustration, I just, I asked them, I said, guys, wouldn't it be crazy if you could find a job, if you could find a career that allowed you to do three things? And they said, well, what, what are the three things? And I said, passion, purpose, and the ability to provide. One job mm. that most of the time allowed you to do those three things. Yeah. And my buddies, to be honest, they kind of scoffed at me. They looked at, they heard that and they kind of said, well, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that really exists. Yeah. I mean, think about like, like a school teacher, you know, they're, they're full of, you know, their job's full of passion and purpose and helping students. Yeah. But every summer, you know, they're looking for, they're looking for extra work to be able yeah. to provide or look at a doctor, you know, they make great money, but the stress they're gone from their family you know, the malpractice, the, all of the, the, the notes. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's always full of passion and purpose. No. And then my, my friend leaned over and he said, I, what you're talking about is rare. 
it's an anomaly. Mm. And I, and mm. I said, anomaly, what? what? What do you mean? He goes, it just doesn't happen. And that's when the quote from Oscar Wilde hit, hit my head again. To live is the rarest thing. Like to really live. Yeah. And two weeks after that conversation, I quit my job. And I jumped into the world of professional speaking. And uh, I started an organization called the Undercover Millennial Program. It's kind of like Undercover Boss uh, without yes. the makeup. If anybody's seen that TV show. Yes. And, uh, and, and went into the world of professional speaking. Why? Because it covered those three things. It was something that I was passionate about. It allowed me to do something bigger than myself, which fulfilled a purposeful meaning. And it also allowed me to provide in a way that was sufficient for me. And up to current day, and that is what I am doing and have been doing for almost five years. And the day I quit my job was truly the day I started living. Mm -hmm. And you know, am I a, am I a pilot? Uh, am I am I doing that full time now? No. But I did learn that sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fit together. And uh, six years ago, I got a phone call from the Moran Eye Center. And they said, Clint, we just started the first human trial for a new procedure called cross-linking. And it's, it's brand new. It's not FDA approved, but it's stopping the progression of the disease for people with your eye disease. Yeah. And I mean, it was literally a, a miracle from God because I was going blind. I'm barely, uh, <clears throat> right now, I'm barely legal to drive. I, I have right. hard gas permeable lenses, but I was able to get on the list, Michael, and I was number 42. And they flew me mm. back to California and I had the procedure on my right eye. And then four months later, I had the, the other procedure on my left eye. Right. And it 100% stopped the progression of the disease. Oh, wow. And uh, again, sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fit together. I never would have gone to school, you know, the medical school journey. I would have never met those great mentors. I would have never, my life has become so much different because of sometimes the problems, right? Sometimes <clears> the good <throat> things that we hope for when it falls apart, we can look at COVID right now. We can look at the pandemic and how yeah. things have really been dismal, but there's also been some good. I'm, I'm convinced that when we look at our, our story, our lives, there's, there's two types of people. There are the people that constantly see the problems. Yeah. Or there's the people that constantly see the opportunities. And I think, you know, striving to focus on that, try, striving to, to, to see the good has allowed me to create a better story. Awesome. That's, that's amazing. So I, I have a, I love that story. I, I, you know, it's a true story and it's, for me, it signifies one of my beliefs that when things don't go right in our eyes and in, in, no, I didn't mean to say in our eyes, in our head, yes. like it's not gone right. I, the first thing I say, it's a gift. Now, we don't know in that moment in time whether it is or isn't a gift, mm -hmm. but to reframe it as a gift, and I appreciate that lots of people have an issue with this, especially when it comes to when people die, that isn't necessarily a gift, but maybe it was, you never really know, you know, yeah. would somebody's life have been better alive or not? Would the suffering have been worse for them or not? You just never know. So even when it comes to death, it sometimes can be a gift. I'm not talking about when people get killed and, you know, they get into accidents and things. I mean, it's, it's awful, but apart from the kind of dying side, which is horrible, I appreciate that. Not for the individual who's passed, by the way, but for the people that are left because they're the ones who are in suffering. The person who's gone is no longer in suffering. Yes. So, but when, when you see that things are a gift, like you've seen, things can change for the better as a result of it. 
Now, I have a question about the career into speaking, right? I, I'm really curious to know how did that come about? So what was the catalyst that says, I want to do public speaking? How did that come about? Yeah, I, I was I was I was speaking in church. I got asked to give a talk in church as a senior in high school. And I, I just gave this talk and there was a gentleman in the audience that owned a leadership consulting company. And he heard me speak and he came up after and he said, listen, I'm doing a conference for a bunch of teenagers down in Southern Utah. And I would love it if you would come and speak. I want you to come and, and talk to the kids. I was still a kid. I, I still feel like I'm a kid. Uh, yeah. he, and I was like, I was like, no, I'm okay. I, yeah, speaking is not really my thing. I, I'm, yeah, I have no desire to go talk to other high school students. <laughs> right. And he's, he's like, listen, I'll, I'll pay you five hundred dollars. And I was like, okay, what day do you? <laughs> <laughs> that's the honest truth of how it all kind of came to me. And I, I mean, for a high school kid, that's that's a that's a good amount of money. And sure. I went around, but it it was that moment, it was that opportunity that sparked the possibility. Right. I put together this little workshop. Uh, I have been a drummer for for 22 years of my life, and have played professionally for a long time. And I put together this workshop called "To the Beat of the Drum," and everybody had buckets and drumsticks. And I just taught teamwork principles, but through music and what I had learned as a musician. Mm. And I loved it, Michael. It lit my heart on fire. I just oh wow, there's nothing like it. And when kids would come up and say, "This changed my life," this mm. This changed my perspective. Like I'm going to live differently because of what you said. Like that yeah. was crazy to me as a young senior in high school. And then, and then schools came up after the conference and they said, we want you to come and speak. Mm. We want you to come and talk. Hey, we do this a lot at our schools. We, we want to bring you in. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay. And I went and did these schools and it just, it just kind of took off from there. And so I had that little bit of a, a little bit of a taste of that. I, I had a little bit of a, of an, of a, of a mind opening there of, okay, this, this could be cool. And it, and it, I felt alive. It was the time where I really felt living. And here's the crazy thing is I did, I did somewhat even bury that because I never looked at it as a substantial career. No, I never looked because it doesn't have benefits. Michael, we, I don't have, it's the entrepreneur life. If we make money mm. in my family, it's because I did something. It's not because of a salary. There is no cushion. No, so no. It, it's the entrepreneur life of we work 80 hours a week, so we don't have to work 40, <laughs> yes. uh, which is, which is good for some people and horrible for others. There's no right way. But for me, this career has allowed me to live the three P's, my passion, my purpose, and my ability to provide. And yeah. I think having that combination of those three things is what's drived me and helped me to continue to sustain myself and my family, even during times of COVID, for example, our whole industry disappeared. Yes. In two weeks, March yeah. 6th was my last live speaking again, event. Mm. And in two mm. weeks, the whole world fell apart. And all of my events, I had uh, 48 events cancel or postpone. Yeah. For the year 2020. Uh, and we watched, you know, as everything fell apart, we'd worked so hard to build this organization and this brand and this message. Mm. But we, again, we had to pivot. We had to see the opportunity in the chaos. And now we, we do everything virtual. And it's been a beautiful journey. It's not live on stage, but we're getting through it. And now we have a beautiful virtual studio, a new offering. Uh, and we've been able to reach hundreds of thousands of more people just because we're doing it virtual now than we ever would have without it. So again, yeah. you know, sometimes good things fall apart so that better things fit together. Another gift. Yeah. Yep. And so, but did you, when, I mean, okay, I'm originally a Dutchman, right? And I did not learn public speaking when I was a youngster going to school in the Netherlands, but I met, people that had been to school in America, in the USA, in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and they were so eloquent when they had to speak, right? They would just impress me significantly. 
Okay. It wasn't until 2007, no, 2005, that I decided to learn public speaking myself. But somehow in American schools, quite a lot of kids become very good at public speaking at a very young age. So when you had to go and speak in church, did you already have, well, although you kind of dismissed as saying, I'm no good at it, what what was it inside of you that then gave you the courage to do it? Yeah, I think every time, even now, as I do it professionally, um, over a hundred times a year, and I, I, I'm speaking a lot, I still get nervous. I still get nervous. Uh, and I think the nerves and the nervousness is because I care. Yeah. I care. I care about the message. And I think that's that's sometimes the biggest hump in public speaking is just to control your nerves and and mm. do it as much as you possibly can. As, as a young child in church, we would give little primary talks and they would, I don't know, it was just like a thing that in our church, we don't have a pastor or a minister. Or it, it's you, the, the, the talks in church are done by the members of the church. And right. so- I kind of just grew up, you know, how to put a talk together, how to formulate a point, how to make an introduction, right. how to conclude. And my yes. dad, my dad was a good, was a good speak, speech coach for me. He, he, I think I still right. think to say, my dad taught me how to tell stories. My dad taught me how to really captivate an audience, how to, right. uh, you know, bring people into that journey. And so I think it's a combination of a lot of stuff that over time yeah. uh, turned into a message. Okay, so so I'm I'm clear now. I'm clear how everything got together. So I'm a drummer, a uh, different drummer to you. I started in kit drumming when I was like 18, 17, 18 in London in a punk band, but I gave it up and I've regretted it all my life. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I discovered Japanese taiko drumming. Awesome. which comes back back to what you were mentioning earlier about group dynamics you know a team so yes. you're drumming in a team and i like covid struck so we couldn't drum together anymore in school halls and things so we had to go virtual so i i assisted my taiko drumming teacher to do everything online so the whole digital experience and everything quite tricky but we we pulled it off You've been drumming for 20 years. How did you get into drumming? It's a great question. In school, I was the kid that could never sit still. <laughs> I still <laughs> had a hard time sitting still. I, I, would, my, I would tap. I, my right hand would just move. My left hand would just move. I've been sitting on my hands in this interview. Uh, I, just, I just like to move. It's, it's a part of who I am. But to other people, if you've ever been in a room and someone's, you know, tapping their foot or clicking a pen, you're just like, oh, my gosh, for the love of everything that is holy, <laughs> just stop. Tapping. Yeah. And uh, I got sent to the principal's office and I'll never forget because I, I got sent because I was tapping and the principal had no idea what to do with me. And he said, just try sitting on your hands. OK, when you go back to school, just try sitting on your hands. Hmm. Go back to class. That worked for like five minutes. And then mm. my feet would start tapping. And it happened again and again until one day there was a teacher. And his name was Mr. Jensen. And he had been teaching for a long time. Old teacher, white hair, always wore suspenders. But he was a lovely person. Mm. And he, he looked at me and he, he didn't yell, but he said, Clint, I need to, I need to see you after class. And it was right when I was tapping. I mean, it was right as I was disrupting the class. And he said, we're going to talk. Stay after class. Yeah. And all the other kids were like, oh, Twitcher's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I got called the tapper, the Twitcher, every name under the book. And I was, I was honestly, uh, I was scared. The bell rang, class dismissed, and it was just me and Mr. Jensen. And then he motioned for me to come over. He sat me down next to his desk and he said, listen, I know I... Everybody calls you the problem. He said, Clint, I, I watch you. you. You tap constantly. You know, you, your right hand will move and then your left hand will move. He said, but I, 
I think you're ambidextrous. And I was like, no, I'm Presbyterian. He goes, no, that's <laughs> not what it means. Said, no, no. He said, he, he said, can you tap your head and rub your belly? Yeah. And I gave it a go and I could do it. I could do it just without thinking about it. And then he said, can you rub your head and then tap your belly? And then tap your belly and rub your head. And literally back and forth, I could just do it. Yeah. And he leaned back and he laughed for a minute and he said, I knew it. I knew it. And, he, and, and then he leaned forward. He looked at me and he said, I don't think you're a problem. Mm-hmm. I just think you're a drummer. Wow. And, and remember, Michael, when I talked about that, I am a person that believes in moments. Mm. Moments in time that change our lives. And in this moment, Mr. Jensen, he leaned back in his desk and he opened up the top drawer and he reached inside and he took out my very first pair of drumsticks. Oh my God. <laughs> my very first pair. And he put them in my hands. And I'll never forget, Michael, when he, here's the thing, as a young kid, I was 10 years old at the time. And I did not know the significance of this moment at this time in the story. But I do remember him saying, I, I want you to take the, the sticks, but you have to promise me something, Clint. Promise me you'll just keep them in your hands. Just, just practice with them. He said, go play on your bed, you know, just keep them in your hands and let's see what happens. Yeah. And that was 22 years ago. And I can honestly say from 22 years ago to literally this exact day, I have tried my best to keep drumsticks in my hands. I've traveled and toured and recorded all over the world uh, with artists, musicians. I've played in arenas. Uh, I played with the Blue Man Group. I played with Carrie Underwood, Tim McGraw. Remember when I went to college, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I graduated in 2012 with a bachelor's degree and zero college debt, no debt from school. Why? Wow. Music scholarships. Uh, and, and, and here's the thing, and I'm not saying all this to go, wow, good for you, Clint, or that's amazing, or yeah, that's not the reason. The reason I'm saying this is because of one person who created a moment that sparked possibility. And that mm. moment allowed me to live a better story. Yeah, and, uh, he really did influence my life, and uh, yeah, he's still alive. I call him Larry now, Mister <laughs> Mr. Jensen, uh, <laughs> and he is he's so impactful and uh, really um, has changed everything for me. He's still a part of my life, and we recently I just won an Emmy award for uh, directing a, a short film that he is a part of. That we recreated that story. And it's been shared millions of times all over the world. And uh, we re- yeah, we were just awarded an Emmy Award for that. And congratulations. Our- yeah, thank you. But it shows again, you know, to, to your podcast, right? That everybody's got a story. Yeah. And, and you know, it needs to be heard. And mm. I think what makes the great stories great are, you know, that that triumph over struggle and the good and seeing the opportunity, not the problem. And that's yeah. what the Mr. Benson story is all about. And and this this is this a film you saying you you did and where can people find it? Yeah, it's on YouTube. So if you just type in "Be a Mr. Jensen" on YouTube, yeah, uh, the, video, the video will pop up and yeah, enjoy it. It's Be a Mr. Song. Jensen. Wow, Mr. cool. Jensen. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll put it in the show notes as well, so everyone can go and have a look. Thank Thank <laughs> That's you. a great story. I'm so glad I asked the question. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, so so we got the drumming out of the way. We got the journey into speaking out of the way. So tell us about, well, you told us about what you're doing virtually, but tell us more too about that. But you've got a new gift coming very soon. Uh, so tell us about, about that, please. Yeah, for the last four years, I have been writing a book Uh, based off of my research as the undercover millennial. So I'm a millennial myself. Uh, I'm I'm 33 years old. And five years ago, I was in New York and I had an opportunity to meet with a a gentleman in his store. And he owned the store. It was a sporting goods store. And he talked about how wonderful his business was, how great everything was going. And then I asked him about his management style. And I said, have you had to change how you manage your employees today 
versus how you manage, say, 20 years ago. Yeah. And he fired back and he said, nope, nope, I manage the same today and I get results. It works. Yeah. And I remember I was in his store and I looked around and all of his employees were my age or younger, Gen Z, millennials. And I just, I had a thought, it was another moment. And I said, I wonder if they would say the same thing. Mm. I wonder if they would have the same perception of this business. And so we had about 35 minutes to kill until we could go to the next place to meet our next person. And he gave us like a discount in the store to go buy stuff. I didn't want any stuff. I had 35 minutes to kill. So I literally just walked up and I talked to one of his employees. And Michael, I look like how I look today. I have a backwards hat on. I just in, in you know normal clothes. I was a customer. Yes. And I walked up to the first employee and I said, hey, what's it like to work here? Mm. And it was interesting because the employee got really quiet, you know, kind of like looked around. I felt like we were doing like an illegal drug exchange. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Do you really want to know? And I said, I said, yeah. I said, I, I, yeah, I, I genuinely want to know. Yeah. He said, I, I can't stand it here. Wow. I hate, I hate my job. My job is just a job. I'm here to just, you know, literally collect the paycheck. I'm a cog in the wheel. I don't even think my manager knows that I'm working today. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, hold up. I said, so why are you still here? And he said, no, I've applied to three other places. Right. And as soon as I get an offer, I'm out. And I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe, maybe the kid's having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And I asked another employee and another and another and another. And by the end of the 35 minutes, I had interviewed six of his employees, six of this guy's staff. And out of the end of those conversations, five out of the six of them said they would not be working for this guy and his store in less than three and a half months. Whoa. Almost every one of his employees were ready to bounce and looking for a better opportunity. And I remember thinking, what if the CEO could hear this? Hmm. What if the CEO could actually know like the perception of what an employee wants. Most of the time, managers have no idea that they're doing poorly. Because sure. if I struggle with you as a manager, I'm not going to tell you face to face. Nope. I, I will tell another millennial. Yes. They, they coworkers, they talk. Trust me. And, and the cool part about all of this is they told me because I was younger, but I was also a customer. I wasn't a manager. I wasn't a survey. Mm, and, mm. and that was the day I started the Undercover Millennial Program. And right. for the last four years, I've worked with 181 organizations, and I've gone undercover into uh, and I, undercover. I've interviewed over 10,000 employees as Whoa. the Undercover Millennial. It has been the most massive undertaking of my life. But the cool part is I go in as as someone who's looking for a job. Yeah. So I'd walk into you know. Uh, the local pub or uh, the, the grocery store or the Verizon store or what, what the cell phone store. And I would just, as someone who's looking for a job and I'd walk up to the first person and say, Hey, I'm just thinking about applying. Uh, I'm looking for work. What's it like to work here? What's it like to work here is such a great question. <laughs> and they tell me everything, everything, yeah. the good, the bad, what works, what they hate, what they love. But again, mm. the cool part is I get what's real. Yeah. It's not data driven through a survey. It's honest. It's it's their thoughts. It's a it's a one on one conversation that is full of vulnerability. And what we can do with that is then I then go and train the leaders and the managers. We keep everybody's identity safe, but we yeah. give them the insight of what their employees are thinking so they can create a workplace environment that allows people to have those three P's. Yeah. Passion, purpose, purpose, and the ability to provide. To provide, yeah. How do we help people to not just survive at their job, but thrive? Mm. And so I, I, I wrote a, a book about it. And the book uh, releases globally on April 13th. And I decided to, to call the book, I Love It Here. How great leaders create organizations their people never want to leave. And because that was the magic of all of the research, Michael, when I would ask an employee, what's it like to work here? And they would respond with, I love it here. Mm. When they would, people said that. 
And people would say that a lot. And when it would trend in an organization, I love my job. I yeah. love what we do. I love my manager, Susie. You got to meet Susie. Like those yeah. types of responses. And then I was able to research what great leaders were doing to create that type of a mindset for their people. Yeah. And it, it's a beautiful book because it's not another leadership book written by a, a leadership expert. No, this is a book written by the perspective of 10,000 employees who mm. knew when their leaders were getting it right. So that's the uniqueness of it. And it's never been done before. And I, I think it's really going to help anybody that if you're a leader, you're a teacher, even a parent, if you have relationships in your life and you want to strengthen those mm. and create a connection where people like themselves best because of you, then this, this book's worth a read for sure. And it sounds absolutely incredible. And how did you capture the information? Because if you're kind of undercover, yes. are you there with, you know, a little notebook and quickly scurry off in a corner and write some notes down? Or how did yes. you how did you capture the information? Yep. So we have hidden cameras. So I have a pen and there is a camera in the top of the pen. And right. I would just the camera i would have a jacket that had a little pocket right here and i would walk up we'd hit record before i would i would go into uh the store or the franchise or the business and we would record the stories and then i would use that and then we would we would quantify the data what's working what's not working how many Got people it. said they loved it how many people said they hated it what were the top reasons why they hated it what were the top reasons why they loved it what are we seeing and then we wrote all of that down and then we would put that in our proposals, in our outlines uh, for our trainings and what we, we would talk about to the businesses. Now what I do primarily is I, I, we don't do a lot of the undercover work. We did do, do some through COVID just because I was genuinely curious. Yes. But now with the breadth of 10,000 employees that we've, un, we've interviewed, we've mm. taken all of that data and we've looked at the overarching principles. Yeah. Because there were always principles. There was always a... A, 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 an eternal truth to why people loved their job. Yeah. I thought, okay, well, how do I take these principles and, and almost like put them in a, a, a curriculum of sorts, like to help leaders, like if you do these things consistently through the eyes of your employees, this is what matters. This is what people talked about. And so that's how we did it. That's how we wrote the book. So you would customize it for each organization, depending on the feedback that you got from the employees. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it's not, it's not a textbook kind of, these are the things you've got to do like a, they call it, we call it in the UK because I had some time in training kind of sheep dip approach. You're not using a sheep dip approach. You use a customized approach for that organization based on the feedback that you were getting. That's right. And every culture is different. But again, so for example, one of the things that we, we undercover that we found is, is the power of communicating potential and worth to an individual. So potential would be like growth opportunities. If, yeah. if employees can't grow where they're at, they're, they're going to grow somewhere else. Yes. But then the worth side is recognition. Making mm. sure people are seen, they're heard, yeah. they're understood. Yeah. So potential and, and worth. Now, a, a cell phone store might do that differently than a hospital. Yeah. Or, the, you know, a, a janitorial service might do that different than a tech company. Yeah. But the overarching principle of, of doing that is, is the focus. So that's really mm. what the book talks about is, yes, you have to customize it. Yes, you have to personalize it. Yes, you have to focus on individuals, but the principle of potential and worth is what works. And, so, and it's the same for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. the universal principle. And that's, and that's all people want at the end of the day. Isn't it? Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it's not, when you put it in those simple terms, why wouldn't anybody understand it and make sure that they were trying to achieve that for people? <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, Michael, it blows my mind that there are people, there are bosses and managers that we saw so many times. We call them the controlling managers. Yeah. Just, they just didn't want to, right? Or they were calloused. They were burnt out. They were tired. Yeah. 
and 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 they did more harm than they ever did good and then they wondered why why their retention rates were so low mm. and why nobody stuck around and why everybody was miserable and why productivity mm. wasn't where it needed to be yeah management management is the number one reason why people stay in a job mm. and it's also the number one reason why people leave a job mm. and, and so you know yeah, I, I think it's worth a read. It's worth a read to kind of go, okay, if you're open to change and you're open to, to doing a little bit better, this book's going to help you with that. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, equally, those managers, and I, you know, could also be suffering with the same issue, right? Yes. The potential and worth. And because often what you get, you get a domino effect, which is it starts from the top of the organization and it depends how they're treating the manager, you know, the top of the organization, how they're treating the managers and then the managers just copy, right? They just kind of go, okay, well, this is how I'm being treated. So I'm going to treat my people exactly the same way. You're exactly right. Yep. Hmm. Yep. And, and, and two, I mean, I've told so many managers, like, it's okay it's okay if you're feeling like this is just not where you want to be. It's crazy. So many managers become managers because they were just promoted. That's they, right. they were good employees. Maybe they had high sales or they were great with customer service. And so the organization is like, well, then the, ne the next step is to promote you into yeah. management, but that does not make you a good manager. <laughs> no. uh, and, and we found that a lot where people were put in this position where they needed to connect they needed to empathize. They needed to develop people, inspire mm. people, mm. and they just didn't want to. And so I always tell managers, if you're in that position, it's okay. And sometimes mm. there's an ego drop where you're like, oh, if I leave management, that's a shot to my ego. Because we that's associate right. management to position and to authority. And, you know, that's like a ladder move. Like you're, you're moving up. Mm. And I don't know, we've got to get over that because it's, uh, when the shine wears off of management, it is work. It is a ton of work to do it right. Mm. And, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes there's a, a better opportunity or something else that will, will still help you make the money that you're hoping to make and that will still help you be impactful. So, yeah. so, so tiny little story. I remember I'm a little bit older than you. So 20 years ago when I was still employed, there was a survey that came out about the future of management in the UK. And it said the biggest skill shortage coming up over the next decade, and I bet it's still the same, is getting properly qualified managers in organizations. Not about whether people could do IT or they knew how to operate machinery or anything like that. Those weren't the skill shortages. The skill, the biggest skill shortage was going to be management skills. Yes. Because no one is trained properly yes. in management. They are promoted into management because they have the, you know, the the skill, the technical skills of the job, and that they're best at those technical skills. Therefore, they can manage the people that carry out those technical skills. Wrong. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm. It, yeah. Uh, uh, a no clearer and more powerful statements ever been made, Michael. That is spot on. And, yeah. and, and again, yes, there's the technical side and having credibility and having competence yep. in the thing that you're managing. Mm. But then there's the part about care and people connection and yeah. advocating for people, learning how to, uh, again, communicate the potential of somebody to communicate mm. the worth of an individual. That is what employees talked about. No employee said, man, they just kill it, you know, in their competency in the job. They, they run a meeting so well, and that's why I stay at my job. Nobody said that. No. They talked about the times where they believed in them. They talked about advocacy. They talked about my boss is not a boss. My boss is a mentor. My boss right. cares about me. My boss wants to connect me to my dreams. And I've mm. learned with all the 10,000 employees that we've interviewed, Every employee is asking the question, let me know when it gets to the part about me. <laughs> and, and here's the thing is some people hear that and they go, well, those entitled little shining <gasps> stars in my life, right? <laughs> they think, oh, you're so entitled. You're like, 
You want this, you want that, you want a raise, you want the, the, the beanbag chairs, you want the ping pong tables. But, yeah. but in reality, it's not about entitlement. It's about good humanity. It's about bringing humanity back into the business. Mm. And I think when we have that mentality, right, it's the shift. Don't see a problem. Let's see an opportunity. And when you can get to the part about the employee, you're making the deposit of trust. Mm. You're making a mm. deposit into their lives. Mm. And the more deposits you make allows you as a manager to make the withdrawals. Mm. Right. I've connected. No significant loyalty ever happens without significant connection. Yeah, I believe that, Michael. And, yeah. and too many people, too many managers are standing in front of a fireplace and saying, give me heat and then I'll give you wood. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We have to connect first. We have to build those those intangible soft skills that sometimes yeah. managers don't want to do. They don't want to work on that. They don't want to, but to the employees, it's what mattered. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also because of your age and the millennial side of things, I think there is a workforce of millennials that will have the biggest voice in the workplace going forward, you know, yeah. That's the biggest growth of the workforce is going to be the millennial cohort on the planet. Yes. And therefore managers who are not millennials need to understand what millennials need yes. <laughs> as well. Yep. And, and, and too, it's, I do think that based off of my age as a millennial, I have grown up in a world that is different than maybe what the world was when a baby boomer was my age. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing I have seen is that the quicker we can stop looking at people as a generation and you can start looking at them as people, the more successful you will be in your leadership. Mm. For example, I think sometimes uh, in my industry, even there's speakers that will say, if you have millennial employees, you have to treat them this way. Mm. You have to work with them this way because that's the way the millennials want it. And that is not true. I, I, there can be nothing further from the truth because people are individuals. Yeah. I met in, I have met millennials that are so lazy. I have met millennials that are entitled, but I have also met millennials who are incredibly hardworking. Yeah. I have met millennials that, that come from a diverse background that are humble, that are, are willing to take opportunity are willing to work and earn it. And then some people will listen to this and go, well, I haven't seen any. Well, then you maybe need to change something about your perspective because to judge an age group, millions, there's millions of us, millions yeah. of millennials. And to put us all in a one size fits all box based off of the day and the year that we were born is foolish. It just, it does not make sense. But yet so many try to do that. Of and course. they put us yeah. in a stereotype or we even do it to boomers, right? The younger yeah. generation will do it to the older generation. And we yeah. cannot do that. We have to remember that people are people and to focus on the individual, not the generation. So I know this book is going to be immensely successful for you, but what are you hoping for with this book? Where would you like it to go? I think I really want it to be a management classic. You know, you talk about, you know, the, the Stephen Covey, Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, or Man's Search for Meaning, or Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, Think and Grow Rich. Like, they're classics. They are really yeah. great books. Yeah. And that's my hope. You know, I spent four years of my life on this, and I wrote it in a universal way that it would be timeless, that they are universal principles that will stand the test of time. That they're true right. principles that are eternal. And so that's my hope is that it will be the management classic, a book that if a manager comes into a position, this is the book they are given. If, if there's a manager that's, that's working with people, this is the book you need to read. That's, yeah. that's my hope. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds great. And I, I wish you so much luck with it. I, I don't think you need it somehow. I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be amazing. And, um, well done. I think it's it's time 
you know, the world needs a book like this. <laughs> I love the title too. It's, it's great. So what else are you doing that you'd like to mention to the listeners? Right now we're just, we're launching the book. And so if anybody's listening, uh, the book is available for pre-order right now. Uh, jump on Amazon, type in, I love it here, Clint Pulver. And I, I would love it if you would pre-order a copy of the book. Uh, maybe even possibly when this releases, it releases nas or globally on April 13th. And so yeah. uh, pick up a copy and, and share the word. And, and if you know a manager or, or your, ha your husband, your spouse, your partner, if they, they work in management, you know, maybe yeah. consider picking up a copy of this book for them. Fabulous, fabulous. Where, apart from Amazon looking for the book, where else can people find out about you? Yeah, on, on Instagram, uh, hit me up on Instagram, Clint Pulver, or you can also find more on my website, which is clintpulver.com. Awesome. Clint, is there anything that I didn't get out of you that you would have wanted to say? <laughs> no, I just really appreciate it. I appreciate the conversation, Mike. I appreciate what you're doing and you're allowing people to, to tell their story. And you I'll maybe end with this. The, uh, in the end of right now with COVID, I believe that in the end, we're going to be okay. I believe that we will get through this. Yeah. And if you're a listener right now and you're not feeling like you're okay, or if you look at the world and you don't think that we're okay, then know that it's not the end. And you still hold the pen to write your story. And yeah. so write a better one. Do what you need to do to write the best story that you can. Look for the moments. Look for the opportunities, not the problems. See the good. And in doing so, I, I think we set ourselves up for the opportunity to live this life, not just exist in this life. Thank you. That's, that's brilliant. Let's end with that. That's awesome. And when all of this is over and you're on your world book tour and you're coming to London, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I'll come yeah. down to London. I'll buy you lunch. And uh, we can have a face-to-face -face chat as well. I'd but thank honored. you so much for coming on the podcast. It was great to hear your story. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Michael. Take care. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.